let your light shine upon us. Hallelujah. Whoa. I want to know your power. Come fill me once again. Lift me up. and your mercy. Hallelujah. Put your hands together. Come on, church. Everybody clap like this. Come on. Hey. Who is like him? Lion and the lamb seated on the throne. Mount 
mountain bow down and the ocean roar to the Lord of hosts. Praise and honor from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. The angels and the saints sing praise. Who is, who is like him? Lion and the lamb seated on the throne. Mountains bow down and the oceans roar to the Lord of hosts. Praise and honor from the rising of the sun. To the end of every day, praise and honor all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise and honor from the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise and honor all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. To the end of every day, praise and honor all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints say praise and honor from the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise and honor all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints say praise. Let's sing praise, give him praise tonight. Hallelujah, glory, glory to God. Praise God. I invite you to lift your hands with us tonight as we worship God. Sing this song, God. Lord, I give you my heart, amen. How many believe that tonight? Hallelujah. We give the Lord all our heart. Glory to God. Jesus said it himself, that is the greatest commandment. And then the second one is just like it, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah lift our hands and worship with all our heart. This is my desire to honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I'll worship you. I give you praise All that I adore Is in you Oh, come on, church, with all your heart, hallelujah Lord, I give you my heart Give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm awake Lord, have your way in me Oh, sing it once again with all your heart This is my desire Within me, yeah. I give. 
Tell the Lord we love him tonight and praise him in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. We want to pray tonight. For uh, Veronica Armstrong, we want to pray for Gilbert Lopez, Johnny Portillo. We want to pray for the Herrera, Ledesma and Hernandez, uh, Prita and Hall and Hilleman family, uh, that God would move and salvation. We want to believe God for their salvation tonight. Amen. Uh, I continue to lift up Sister Princess. Amen. For healing. Hallelujah. I want to continue to pray for David and Angel Leal. Also, God's hand on Sister Connie. I want to believe God for my granddaughter, Olivia, that God would do miracles. Uh, God would touch her. Hallelujah. Uh, perhaps you have family or friends uh, uh, that need healing. Amen. Uh, we want to pray and believe God uh, for them tonight. Uh, we have some special prayer requests. We're believing God for the city of Baytown. Amen. And all that God wants to do there. Hallelujah. We're also praying for marriages. We're believing God uh, for single men and women in the house of God. Teenagers, that teenagers would come. Hallelujah. And let's believe God for souls. Glory to God. I um, want to pray for backsliders to recover. Can you say amen? I want to pray that God would set on fire old converts. Hallelujah. And we get on fire. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. So praise God. We sing an old gospel song. Ain't no rock going to cry in my place. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Ain't nobody going to take my place. Glory to God. I'm going to do something for Jesus. Can you say amen? And so we're going to pray, believe God, uh, continue to lift up the leaders of our nation, the leaders of our fellowship. Amen. Uh, and let's believe God that God's hand will be upon us and all that he wants to do tonight. And so we're going to go before the Lord in prayer this evening. Uh, and when we subside, our brother Javier is going to come and lead us before the throne. But let's take some time and pray together first. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you. Uh, we believe in your name. We trust you. We glorify you. Uh, for you are great and greatly to be praised. Uh, Heavenly Father, rebuke every demonic spirit that would come against the house of God. Father, you speak to our hearts, God. You would help us, God. Breathe on the church. Have your way, Lord, by the grace of God. Move in the truth of your spirit. Father, move right now by the grace that you us. We give you glory this evening, Lord, as you allow us to be here. We praise you and glorify you. I pray, Lord, that you meet with us this evening. God, that you meet where we are at. And we count it a privilege to be able to be here. Before Christmas, Lord, I pray that you give us understanding as the message is delivered to us, that you touch every marriage, every single man and woman this evening, every young man, every young woman, Father. Touch your children. Give us direction, Father, to trust us into a new year to do your will, Father God, that you show us, teach us how to preach the gospel to your people. I pray that you meet with us, Father God, that you cast down strongholds this evening, that you cast down condemnation nation and shame lord for it does not rest with you but oh i pray lord that we receive the joy that you promised us that you that we may receive the promises lord that you have for us i pray that you go before us that you anoint my pastor his marriage lord his ministry lord cover your church with your precious blood and cast down witchcraft this evening lord to all my brethren and sisters i pray that you anoint them that you heal them that you cover them with your mighty precious hand in jesus name amen hallelujah praise the living god let's give god the glory tonight thank you jesus hallelujah praise you in this house thank you hallelujah glory to god encouraged to be with you tonight welcome one and all to the potter's house on behalf of myself pastor melrose and my wife Jana. if we can for just a few moments turn and greet one another tonight hallelujah
want to know your power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Are you glad to be here tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Got a couple of friends in the house. Church, do not forget that we have announced some announcements tonight. Church, do not forget that Friday night we have Bible study. Yeah. Hallelujah. Do not forget. I know some of us making plans. Friday night, there's Bible study. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. At 7 p.m. Do not forget. Let's go and support our brothers and sisters. And sisters, hallelujah. As well, church, I do not forget that Saturday morning, we do have prayer at 10 a.m. Saturday morning here in the church, prayer at 10 a.m. And we're going to be uh, doing some Christmas uh, caroling uh, yeah. outreach. Hallelujah. Hey. We're going to be doing some songs. Hallelujah. Your Lisa is going to help us out. Thank you, Jesus, at 11 a.m. Amen. Church, hallelujah. Let's participate in that. Let's go do something in Pasadena. Hallelujah. As well, church, do not forget that we have the Christmas service at 11 a.m., hallelujah, and 6 p.m. So there's going to be no serious men class or Sunday school. Prayer is going to be at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Sunday. So there's going to be, once again, there's going to be no serious men or Sunday school, hallelujah, uh, this uh, Sunday. So the ser uh, service is going to start the prayer at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. And as well, church, Sunday morning service and Sunday night service, we're going to be believing that God can do a miracle. We're going to be praying for the sick. Hallelujah. So if you're sick that day or you're believing for somebody, we're going to contend for the supernatural that day, this Sunday coming up. As well, church, the end of the year celebration is December 31st. We're going to start at 6 p.m. here. There's going to be a time of food, fellowship, and the lack of talent show. If you wish to participate, the registration... Um, yeah, you could sign up in the church app. All of this information is on the church app. So church, make sure you sign up if you want to participate on that. The information is right there as well. And also church, fellowship, uh, fasting, and prayer vigil begins January the 2nd. Woo! Hallelujah. So fasting, we get an opportunity to fast January the 2nd through the 4th. And the sign-up sheet is in the prayer room if you also want to uh, participate in that. Hallelujah. But I highly recommend it. As well, church. Uh, looking ahead, we have Evangelist Pat, uh, Patrick Johnson. He's going to be preaching for us all day, January 15th. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's a missionary, so, man, I can't wait. Hallelujah. And as well, this is for the men. There's going to be a men's discipleship class uh, at Pastor Correa's church with Pastor Ruby. That's going to be January 16th. Man, so if you want to participate on that, that is not too far away from here. You need the address. I could give you the address as well. Just get with me. And then we're also having a men's discipleship class with Pastor Artie Aragon in Colleen, Texas. Hallelujah, man. So make sure you set some time aside to participate in this. This is available for you. Those are our announcements tonight. God bless. Hallelujah. Praise God. Also, we want to announce that we have a new member uh, to the Potter's House. Hallelujah. Her name is Victoria. Glory to God. Amen. She arrived last night. Amen. Little five pounds, 11 ounces. To itty bitty. But she's here. Hallelujah. So praise God. You guys pray for, for uh, Sister Catherine. Amen. And so we are excited about that. Glory to God. So tonight we want to receive the Lord's tithe and his offering. You say amen. You um, have been, you know, checking up on the news or anything of that nature. You know that uh, the uh, basketball Olympic gold medalist Brittany Griner is home. Uh, but the uh, military officer Whalen is not. And there's been several articles. Obviously, there's been mixed uh, uh, reactions and responses and an article that I came across uh, earlier uh, today was, you know, uh, the article started, why isn't everyone happy uh, that she's home? And, uh, you know, it goes into, um, 
you you would think she you know she's home and and everyone in concert would be excited but a lot of people are not then they begin to break down the charges what she was charged with and what uh officer uh military officer Whalen was charged with he was charged uh, with espionage it's found out to be a sham he wasn't spying on russia or anything of that sort uh but they would not release him uh and then of course uh, Brittany griner was uh caught uh they they accused her of smuggling uh cannabis oil uh into russia and so uh, she was supposed to serve a nine-year sentence which was reduced to 10 months uh, President Biden, in his defense, he was trying to work a deal to get both of them. And it was, uh, they said, well, you get one one or the other or you get nothing at all. And so they said, well, one is better than nothing. So that was their argument. But what, what struck me was the, the reason why the, uh, the reporter was trying to pull for support. Uh, the, the, the writer comes across like, I just don't understand it, you know. And what she said, it, it, it really struck me. She said, we as Americans, we believe in the preservation of someone's race, of someone's gender, and their sexual preference. And you would think everybody is on board with that. And that struck me because what she did, church, is she made a national statement. She didn't say that she supports race, sexual uh, preferences, and gender. She said America does. And nothing could be further from the truth. Amen. We believe in the preservation of Americans, no doubt. But not because they're black not because they're lesbian, and not because they can play basketball. We believe in Americans because this is America. But what, what I wanted to point out to you is she screams out our true values, and it saddened my heart. It's like, really? We believe in that more than a military... Uh, Man who laid down his life for our country. And we prefer to get this, this, this basketball player who during the national anthem refused to come out of the locker room because she hates America. That's very interesting to me. It reminds me of the prophet Haggai in the Bible. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Haggai chapter 1 verse 7, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build a temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. In verse 6, it says, you have sown much, yet bring in little. You eat, but have not enough. You drink, yet you are not filled. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns them to put into a bag with holes. And so it's like, God, what, why, what, what's that all about? Why are you so angry? Why are you so upset? Well, if you know biblical history, the prophet Haggai, as our ushers come, the prophet Haggai began to prophesy against the children of Israel after Babylonian captivity. What was happening is the children of Israel were finally free. That's what the book of Nehemiah is all about. And they begin to build the walls around Jerusalem. How many know that? You have Sanballat, you have Tobiah, they tried to stop them. They tried to stop the people of God. They're building with one hand and they're fighting with the other. It's a very powerful story. You can read it in the book of Nehemiah. And it took the children of Israel 52 days to build a wall around Jerusalem. Haggai comes along 15 years later and the temple of the Lord has yet to be built. So what that speaks of and reason why God had anointed Haggai to preach what he preached is because God had a problem with the children of Israel's value system. We want to build, uh, we want to build to protect ourselves, but the one who set us free, we don't want to build that. 
And so this is very relevant today because unfortunately we have a lot of believers that are more vested in protecting themselves than building the house of God. This is where we get vernacular. You know, I, I've got to beef up my savings and 401k and I've got career and what about my kids and, and all these different things. Uh, the very God that gave those uh, them to you in the first place. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah. We wouldn't have a pot or a window if it wasn't for Jesus. Why would it take 15 years to build the house of God, but less than two months to protect ourselves? Miss Griner is set to make $227,000 this year. We don't know when Waylon is coming home. We don't know if he'll ever come home. In the article, they begin to compare her to LeBron James. They say, well, if it was LeBron James, wouldn't you bring him home? If history is correct, the answer would be no. Well, Pastor, why? Because LeBron James is not gay. Hello, somebody. Listen to me tonight. When, when I speak like that, I'm not speaking to you. It is a spirit that I address. And I, as a pastor, amen, as a sheepdog, I make sure that the house of God is protected from such uh, idiocy. How dare we as believers of God hold more value over that than what God really stands for? Amen. Hallelujah. My prayer is that now that she's home, that perhaps God could send someone her way and tell her how much he really loves her. That's valuable. And I pray as we give tonight, that we always remember what's truly valuable. That's the souls of men and women. Our heads are bowed. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you tonight. This is the last service in 2022 before Christmas Day. I pray, God, that we honor you and we show our true value. And our treasure is you. Father, I bind mammon and covetousness tonight. I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you would bless the gift and the giver. We give you praise in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Most high. I want to see your face. I want to know your ways. Let your light shine upon us I want to know I want to know your power come build me once again lift me up in your hands of grace Hallelujah. Amen. Don't you want God to lift, lift you up tonight? Amen. Glory to God. If you have your Bible with you, the book of Job. The book of Job chapter 1. We're going to go there uh, in the word of God this evening. Hallelujah. We're going to look at um, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> The word slither is a very interesting word. The definition of the word slither means to smoothly move over a surface with a twisting or oscillating motion. I believe it was the year 2016. It was either 2016 or 2018. It was one of those two. In the Prescott Bible Conference, amen, Pastor Campbell uh, preaches every Tuesday night. In fact, I'm almost positive it's 2018. Uh, he preaches every Tuesday night. And usually, you know, the, the, the 
the pastors that preach, it's all geared towards the theme of the conference or something around there. Maybe it's world evangelism. Maybe it's discipleship, giving, uh, different things of that nature. Uh, that's usually, uh, over the years, I've come to expect that type of preaching, that type of motion uh, when it comes to Bible conference. Amen. As a conference uh, a speaker, I've been privileged to preach in the Colleen Bible Conference, and I've also been privileged to preach in the Chandler Bible Conference. And when I'm asked to do so, the first thing I look at is the theme uh, of the of the conference, and I try to uh, uh, craft a message uh, around that theme. How many understand what I'm saying? Uh, but it seems, uh, and, and forgive the, the the football pun, but that particular year that Pastor Campbell was preaching, um, it seems that he called an audible, and he preached a sermon. I mean, the entire sermon was dedicated to the spirit of Leviathan. I'll never forget that. And I know Leviathan, I understand that spirit. It is a python, it is a twisting spirit. And he begins to give examples and casting out demons and different things of that. And I believe we even prayed for people, prayed, uh, prayed for deliverance that night at a Bible conference. That was very, very uh, interesting that night. I remember coming home and uh, my wife and I, we were counseling someone. And we went to pray for this person, and we met Leviathan that night. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen somebody manifest like that. Literally levitating off the ground, writhing and swerving, uh, slithering. Poor baby girl scared my wife to death. We prayed, cast that thing out. Come on, somebody, got to have a little dominion. Amen. But I remember getting on the phone talking to Pastor Tory Williams. I said, hey, uh, you remember that sermon that Pastor Campbell preached on Leviathan? He's like, yeah, man, that was Holy Ghost. I said, look here, bro, I, I, I met him last night. He's like, no. I said, yeah, man. You know, and I said all that to say this. Uh, the definition of slither means to move smoothly over a surface with a twisting or an oscillating motion. Leviathan is not a spirit that you bind one time. You constantly have to keep on your guard because he loves to show up to church. This evening I've entitled a sermon, Slither, and I want to consider with you the father of Leviathan tonight. Job chapter 1 beginning with verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and forth on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. As a child of God, it is critical that we are well acquainted with our enemy. Amen. Some of you have heard me quote from the Art of War book that was written uh, 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 by a, a man named Sun Tzu. And one of the famous quotes in that book is, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, uh, you will seldom lose any battle. And that is very true, not only in warfare, but also in spiritual warfare. Can you say amen? If you know your enemy and you know yourself, you will seldom lose any battle. And so it is critical that the child of God be well acquainted with his or her enemy because he loves to intrude, he loves to disrupt, he loves to corrupt or disturb man and disturb women from striving for God's purposes. But there's something else we need to consider, and you can, you probably, uh, some of you that read the Bible, you probably figured this out by now. We need to understand that God allows this intrusion. Want to know why? Well, let's find out. First of all, consider with me the testing of hearts. 
2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew himself from him, talking about King Hezekiah, in order to test him, that he might know all that was in his heart. So, in the making and shaping of man's character, God often tests us either by his absence or the implementation of evil. We saw this in Genesis. Adam and Eve placed in a perfect environment, a perfect people, um, no belly button. Come on, somebody. Walking with God in the cool of the day, and nobody told them about the snake. And there's terminology in the Bible that exemplifies this. Isaiah 59 the second half of verse 19 says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Luke chapter 6, verse 47 through 49. Whoever comes to me, says Jesus, and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the streams beat violently or vehemently uh, against that house uh, uh, and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the sand without foundation against which the stream beat vehemently, uh, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great." And what these two verses have in common is a holy allowance. In other words, God allowed these things to happen to us so that we would be able to see what is truly going on in our hearts, or he would be able to see, excuse me, what is truly going on in our hearts. Not for him to discover, because God knows everything, but for us to discover. Sometimes God will put you through things, um, not so that he can see what's going on, so that you can see what he sees. One of the beautiful things about dating is you never know how selfish you are until you're involved with another person. Amen. You never really know who you really are until you are involved with other people. This is why church is so important, uh, because God puts us uh, uh, amongst people who think differently, who act differently, who come from different. How many know the church, the concept of church is perfect when it comes to character building and humility and things um, that God could not teach you otherwise on your own. Amen. You can't even smell your own breath. Not without assistance. You can't. Amen. It's a physical fact. And, and I said that is because many times we can't smell our own mess. We can't smell our own flaws and our own mistakes. But you get us around people, then all of a sudden, things that we think are right in the eyes of other people become wrong. Enter the testing of Job. Our text says that Satan appeared with the angels or sons of God. Listen, the Lord allowed him into his presence and into his holy court. Amen. Can you wrap your mind around that? God is reigning on his throne. It's time for the sons of God, the angels who roam to and fro, they do work in the earth, uh, and Satan, amen, we know he's a fallen angel, uh, he comes right in the midst of them, and God calls him out. What are you doing here? What have you been doing? And Satan says, oh, I've been walking around the earth, and I've just been walking to and fro. What, what, what he's doing is he's boasting. He says, I've, been, I've, been walking, I've been walking around the earth since I jacked it up just to see how good the damage is. Because ever since he got Adam and Eve to fall, the keys of death, hell, and the grave were in his back pocket. How many know that? Because sin gave him access. Uh, one of the names of Satan is he's the prince of the power of the air. Hallelujah. So we're not only talking about the natural, uh, but we're talking about the supernatural and the paranormal. People really think they're in control when they do seances. People really think they're in control when they're reading palms and, and curandera and, and, and Santa Muerte. They really, think they're, they really think they're in control. Satan is the prince of this. 
The Bible says he who sins is a slave thereof. So they have no dominion. And Satan is boasting before God. Oh, I've got dominion. You know, I've just been walking around my planet. That's basically what he's saying. And so the Lord allowed him into the presence, and he did this on purpose because of Job. Because immediately God, if you read on in, in chapter 1, he says, oh, well, since you've been walking around, you seen Job? That's my boy. All the wickedness that's going on, Job ain't even phased. Matter of fact, it's, uh, it's about time he's going to start giving me an offering in just a few, just a few seconds. And then you see that you hear this discourse. God allows us uh, to peek into the supernatural, uh, and you hear this conversation that God and Satan are having. And he said, yeah, the, the only reason why he worships you and he serves you uh, is because you protect him. The only time the devil will tell the truth uh, is when it slanders people. Because if we'd be true tonight, uh, many people serve God simply because of good things that are happening in their life. You take that away, where is their faith? As long as the bills are paid, uh, as long as I've got the house, the car, and the dog, uh, then everything's fine. But what if you lose all that at Harvey? What if you lose the house, the pipes burst uh, uh, tomorrow night? How many understand what I'm saying? This is what, listen, mankind has not changed, beloved. And the devil's like, well, the only reason why he's serving you is because everything is going good right now. You take that from him, uh, he will curse you to your face. How many people, uh, they, they're, they're speaking in tongues in church on Sunday, they get fired Monday, and they're cussing Jesus out Tuesday. And God allows the devil to touch his life to prove his devotion to the Lord. And if this is true of Job, then it's true of us. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it's strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, that's not our typical response. Amen. When fiery trials happen, we're like, oh, well, praise God. <laughs> right? If you're anything like me, it's like, Lord, why me? Why now? Please help me. Get off me. Help me. But as you read through the book of Job, you see these terrible things that he had to go through. These afflictions from Satan affected every part of his life. The devil attacks his character, and then the devil begins to attack his health. The devil goes after what he perceives to be most important to Job, right? His oxen, his donkeys, they were stolen. So this is a financial disaster. His sheep, the servants, uh, destroyed by fire. The camels were taken. Uh, the servants were killed. Uh, the storm killed all of his kids. Uh, he's coming against his family. Uh, and then when that didn't work, uh, then he goes back uh, to God and he says, skin for skin. Uh, you let me touch his skin. Uh, you let me afflict his body and he'll curse you. Uh, and God says, okay, I give you that permission, but you are not permitted to, to kill him. And this is where we, we see the boils and the, and the, and the disease that broke out on his, on his body. You know, God do, uh, Satan does that to you and I. First, he'll attack your character. And if that holds true, that holds water, then he's coming after you physically. And his design is to take away everything you possess. The overall truth here is that God lets it happen. Whenever we face difficulties and trials in our lives, we need to make sure that one, we are seeking God Almighty, and two, we are asking the right questions. Rather than asking why me, we should be asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because if we're not careful, beloved, we as Christians, we care more about how we feel than what God is trying to do. 
James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, uh, knowing that the testing of your faith uh, produces patience. Uh, there are people here, you survived some things. Uh, you've gone through some things. Amen. You've gotten some victories over some things, uh, and it cost you. But trust me, uh, you would not be the man or the woman that you are today had you not endured that. Verse 4 says, but the patience... But let patience have his perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So if you want to be complete and lack nothing, uh, then you're going to have to surrender to God's testing of your faith. Many times this testing can be in our own backyard. So we all know and, and we should be aware that the devil seeks to do this to us and in our own lives. Amen. Amen. We should be wary of his devices, as the Bible teaches, but we should also understand that the, de the devil is desperate. You can read about this in Revelation 12. He is a desperate foe seeking our demise by any means necessary, and that includes uh, using people, even people we know, trust, and love. Psalm 55, uh, verse 12, for it is not an enemy uh, who reproaches me, then I could handle it. This is David, uh, uh, Psalm 55, verse 12 through 14. Uh, Nor is it uh, one who hates me, uh, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. Verse 13, but it was you, a man, uh, my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. Um, what David is saying is uh, if, if, if an enemy came against me, I can handle that. If somebody was coming to attack me, I can run. I can hide from them. Uh, but an enemy from the outside um, or a stranger is not who afflicted me. Who afflicted me was my companion. Who came against me was my friend. Somebody I thought I could trust. Verse 14, we took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. And Satan will often use people we know to come against us. The most effective method has been a subtle attack on our character, the ability to slither. Eventually working towards our health, just like Job's affliction, think with me, in two chapters, all of Job's finances, children, and health was gone. Right? Remember, his wife said, curse God and die in the first two chapters. But for the next 38 chapters, his own friends tormented him with pointing their religious fingers at him. You're going through what you're going through because something you did. You need to confess your sin. None of his friends offered to pray for him. None, none of his friends understood, let me get the mind, nothing. They immediately uh, began to uh, uh, cast doubt. Um, they immediately assaulted his character. Um, they did Satan's dirty work for 38 chapters, his own friends. And they found him guilty when he was actually innocent. The Ishmaelites did not capture Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph was sold to the Ishmaelites by his own brothers. Hello, somebody. It makes me wonder who's more dangerous, Satan or the people that he uses? Even people we know, even people we trust. Now, understand, there's times where strangers come into the house of God and seek to stir it up. Amen. We, we, can, smi we can spot them a mile away. Hey, man, they come in with all their funky doctrine and all this kind of stuff, and I just put, hey, come here, bro. This is what we believe this, 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 and this. Are you on board? No. Bye. That's easy. However, there are others who come in, befriend you, gain your trust and confidence uh, only to tear you down. They slither. And, you know, this happens on either side. And what I mean is uh, this instrument of Satan is either somebody new coming in or an old convert who's just been bitter and disgruntled and will transform over the years. And trust me, I don't know which one is more dangerous because we all know the old convert. They attract new believers because of their longevity, but they have no desire to follow the pastor. They have no desire to support the vision of the church. 
And what both of these groups have in common is the ability to slither. They are smooth, they are subtle, and they are deadly. And there are several instances in the Bible, too many to count. Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? I mean, think with me for a moment. In these examples, Jesus was betrayed by his own disciple. As much as the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated Jesus, none of them betrayed Jesus. The most evil person at work in Jesus' life, uh, he wasn't just one of the 70. He wasn't one of the 5,000 that got fed. He's one of the 12. He's in the upper room. A Christian leader turned Jesus in. Cain killed Abel. Amnon raped his sister, Tamar. That's an incredible, incredible sermon on, on dating. David murdered Uriah, one of his most decorated soldiers, in order to hide that he had been sleeping with his wife. David's, David's firstborn son, Reuben, went up into his house and slept with the concubines that David had as a king. David's other son, Adonijah, stood in front of the, of the gate of the, of the kingdom, and he would say out loud, you ever talk out loud on purpose? So people can hear what you're saying. Man, I wish, you know, uh, you know. And so Adonai just like, man, I see these people and they're hurting and they need a, a, a godly counsel, you know, and they, get, they, they, they don't get as much attention from the king. But if they would come to me, I could really direct them and, and help them. And he, the reason why he did that was to usurp the authority of the king. The Bible says Adonijah was good looking. He had personality, and everybody knew Adonijah because he was King David's son, but he hated King David. He wanted to overthrow him, and he didn't go in with a sword. Hello, somebody. He didn't go in and say, you know what, Dad? You know, I'm sick and tired of the way you run things around here. No, he was smooth. He began to slither. What happened to fellowship? Don't tell nobody. I've been around a long time, dog. Rebels come in every shape, size, and color. And they're smooth. Now, I'm not launching a campaign of suspicion. I'm not telling you to hold people with wariness, uh, but what I am saying is it's very possible that the people who say love or, bef or befriend us uh, are actually out for the, our own ruin. As Matthew 7, 16 says, you will know them by their fruits. Here's a thumbnail sketch. People that act like that, people that act like that, very little talk about the kingdom of God. There are some who are away from the house of God, don't sound like Christians at all. That's a good rule of thumb. Do people know that you're saved on your job? Do, do, do they know that you live for God? I mean, do they really? The worst thing that could ever happen, and I've seen this happen in, in, in my life when I was out working in the field, is when sinners who are not saved come and complain to me about a brother that's working with me, they know go to my church. That's when you know you're in trouble. As the Bible says, we have the ability to cause the unbeliever to mock God. Number two, very little activity in the kingdom of God. There's some, seldom if ever, participate in anything. You hardly ever see them on outreach. They don't come to morning prayer, Sunday evening service, impacting, whatever you want to call it. They're not in any ministries, uh, not because they don't qualify, uh, but they're unwilling. And some will even justify with confidence why they refuse to. And most of the time, it has something to do with leadership. Now, they may not say leadership, well, you know, the reason why I ain't in ministry is because I can't stand the pastor. They won't say that. What they will say, you know, it's church, it's church politics. It's politics, you know. He, you know, pastor got his favorite, you know. 
you know, they're absolutely right. My favorites are people that actually live for God. I really like them. I, I like people that love God, that want to do something for God, that are doing something for God. Can you say amen? They're not just talking about it. They, 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 they be about it. They're about that action. In all their faults, in all their shortcomings, at least they're trying. Those are my favorites. Number three, their default is fleshly solutions. There are some who, rather than trust God, lean on their own flesh and strength to solve their problems. They never come to me. Or they make excuses whenever they are encouraged to come to me. They'll even counsel you to do that. You know, you just need to figure yourself out. The fourth is obvious, having a problem with godly leadership or authority. Always questioning the direction of the church. I try to keep it as simple as possible. Discipling men, planting churches, world evangelism. That's it. That's the direction of the church. You got me. And there are many other indicators, but, but these are the few that I've seen over the years, all of which are strategically planted into the young minds of church members who don't know or understand. Now, that's on the inside. But, of course, there are also outside enemies that come in various forms. Some we've, we've seen over the years as sexual predators. Let me tell you something, lady. I'm ten listen, listen, sweetheart. Listen, you going out there missionary dating, you trying to hook up with these guys, you know they ain't saved. They're gonna play the church game. They're not interested in knowing me. They ain't interested in knowing the brothers in the church. They ain't trying to get filled with the Holy Ghost. They're trying to get filled with you. Rebels come into church all the time. Church Class clowns come into church all the time. Secret sinners come into church all the time. All of which have charming personalities and attract weak or disgruntled Christians. So the difficult question to ask ourselves is this. Am I being finessed by somebody like that? Or the second question is, am I finessing somebody like that? Because it's a slither, it's a slithering. Satan was bold coming into the throne room of God. Bold. Satan, what are you doing here? Well, you, you, you know, you know, Father. I couldn't believe it. I, I can't make this stuff up to save my life. They have a drama, and the entire drama is built around Satan taking a vacation. He's just tired. He's tired, he's tired, of, uh, he's just mad at his dad, and so he's living on earth, and he runs a nightclub, and he goes around, and I was like, are you serious? I can't make this stuff up. It's an actual, like, television show. Bold, cocky, I can just do whatever I want. And unfortunately, there are people that act the same way. Now, before I conclude this sermon, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure some of you are asking, Pastor, why are you preaching this? What are you talking about? What are you getting at? What I'm getting at, beloved, is by the Spirit of God, we're getting ready to go higher. Oh, we're getting, I'm telling you, it's about to get wide open up in here. The Holy Spirit is coming. He's coming in force. He's going to bless and move in this church like you've never seen in your life. And the worst thing that could ever happen is you're on the outside looking in because you got conned by somebody who knows how to slither. Or you got conned by Satan and were taught by Satan to slither. As David said in Psalm 55, if it was somebody on the outside, if it was an outside enemy, that's nothing. It's the companion. It's the one in the foxhole with you. We need to be devoted to God, yes. But we need to be devoted to one another. Powerful book I'm reading right now is one of the things this guy said, you know what, I just need some self-discipline. If I just had self-discipline, you know, I could really get some things done. And the counselor said, well, where are you going to get the self-discipline from? He said, uh, 
What do you mean? He said, well, well where are you going to get it? Because obviously you ain't got it. So where are you going to go get the self-discipline? Well, I'm going to get the discipline from myself. And so, well, if you can get discipline from yourself, you wouldn't be sitting in the office talking to me about how you don't have self-discipline. Right? And he said, well, where can I get self-discipline from? Well, self-discipline comes from other disciplines. And his point was, you need people. You need an outside source to help you. You can't do it on your own. Amen. How many know there's no lone rangers in the kingdom of God? You know, I've been here, I've been long, I've been here long. I got revelation. I know what I'm talking about. Blah, 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 blah. There's always there, listen, there's always somebody stronger. There's always somebody higher. There's always somebody better than you. And listen, I learned that the hard way. Because when you got talent and ability, you think you everything in a bag of chips. It's like, no, 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 son. You, you, you need more than what you got. Hello, somebody. Deliverance takes place uh, when you give yourself to other people who can help you. Don't be so quick to judge somebody because you've been saved longer than them or you've been in the church longer than them or maybe your resume is a little bit more stellar. It doesn't matter. God will use people up. If God can use a jackass to talk to a prophet, I'm pretty sure he can use somebody that you may see, see as small in your eyes that can save your soul. As Sun Tzu said, know your enemy and know yourself. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, as we close, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, thinking to change the times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand for a time and times and dividing of time. Revelation 13, verse 5 through 7. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue 42 months or three and a half years. We open his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Listen, look at verse 7. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Matthew 24, verse 11 through 13. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because wickedness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. You know, the Bible goes on to say in Revelation that the wrath of Satan has been poured out against mankind because he knows that time is running out. Folks, we're in the last days. This is not a time to play games with God. Can you say amen? This is not a time to shuck and jive, to squander our calling, uh, or to take hell for granted. We must be prayed up, uh, armed to the teeth, uh, and ready to defend our character and health in Jesus' name. So how do we do that? First, we know ourselves. Romans chapter 7, verse 17 and 18. Uh, but now it is no longer I who do it, uh, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, uh, no good thing dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. In other words, what Paul is saying uh, is I, I'm, just, I'm not going to look to myself uh, for goodness. Uh, I need to go elsewhere. That's why I come to church, amen. I need to, uh, how to do good, I can't find, I can't sit at home and find goodness. I got to get into God's presence, can you say amen? I got to get around other, other godly people, talk to me. We must be, uh, be willing to admit uh, that we are fallen by nature and desperately need God's strength and love to see us through. And God uses people to, to do that. Don't, don't suppress your sinful nature. We need to shed the light of God on it and live a life of repentance. Know yourself. Number two, know the God we serve. James 1, verse 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Know this and know this very well. God is good. And God is for you. He is not against you. Can you say amen? To give you a future and a hope. And that isn't the end of the truth. Let's finish it. God is not, not only good, but God is good to me. Oh, come on, church. Say it with me. God is good to me. Come on, say it one more time. I didn't hear everybody. God is good 
to me, you'd be amazed at how many Christians don't believe that. God is higher than our experiences. God is higher than our past. God is better than our parents. God is good. He is good to you no matter what has happened or what is happening in your life. Know your God. For the Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Now, we've exhausted the strategies and intent of Satan. We must remain wary of his devices, beloved. That, you know, keeping our minds stayed on Jesus is a worthy and noble cause and act against hell. And the Bible tells us best in Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it are the sources of of life. You know, we guard our hearts by depositing the kingdom of God in it. As we build up our most holy faith, Ephesians says, the Lord will guard us from wickedness. Listen to me, church. Salvation is more than a prayer. Amen? Salvation is a surrendered life. Lord, I surrender. What do you, what do you want me to do? There's a gospel group called Red Hands and one of my favorite songs from them is, is called Your Will. And at the end, they say, let your will be done. What, we'll say whatever you want us to say. Let your will be done. We'll do whatever you want us to do. Let your will be done. We'll go wherever you want us to go. A, a, a salvation, a life of salvation is a surrendered life. This means decisions going forward must be made as we take on the Father ourselves and shed the world. Because Satan knows that his time is short. And he will use people to hurt you. He will use people to cut you. He will use people to violate you. And what's worse is many of these violations and things that happen in our lives, the people that do it don't even know they're doing it. Because sometimes God, uh, the devil doesn't use sinners to do it. Amen, somebody. I say, you know, Lord, I don't know why this happening, why this is happening. But God, tell me what to do. Show me what I need to do. This is the way. Walk in it. You need to be steadfast. You need to be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Say, so, you know what, God? I'm going to keep my head down, and I'm just going to keep on going forward. And God, you take my enemies out. You preserve me against that day. And the devil can't touch you because you're not looking at your past. You're looking at what God wants you to be. That's how we ward off the slithering snakes that the devil would send our way. Let's bow our heads and hearts tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah today. There are people here tonight, perhaps you're not saved. You don't have a relationship with God. You know about God. Perhaps you've had a, an experience of some sort. But listen, God is greater than that. And if you be honest tonight, God has been good to you. You know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. I think about that. I've used that, that, that scripture a lot. When I talk to people about Jesus, I witness to people or, you know, I, I just know that scripture. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What I've never considered until now is, okay, if the wages of sin is death, uh, how come I don't know when I'm going to get paid? I don't know. I don't know when I'm going to receive those wages. In other words, beloved, we don't know when death is coming any more than I know uh, whether when I'm going to heaven. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. And we don't know when we're going to die either, do we? The wages of sin is death. All I know is if I continue to work for sin, then death is what I have to look forward to. But if I receive the gift that Jesus gave when he died on the cross for my sin, if I accept that gift, then I'll have everlasting life. So, beloved, what, what do you choose this evening? Do you want to collect your wages for sin? Or do you want to receive the gift that Jesus Christ offers tonight? 
He offers salvation, beloved. He offers life. What's so beautiful about God is God wants to forgive. He wants to forbear. He wants to redeem and restore in all these wonderful romantic terms. He created you and I for relationship and service. And he knew of our wickedness. He knew man was wicked. He knew when sin entered the world, he knew the only end to sin is total destruction. There's coming a day where God is going to step back and he's going to let sin destroy itself. Friend of mine, don't hold sin in your heart. Don't be a vessel of destruction. You can escape that tonight. You can give your life to Jesus. That's where we get that, that terminology, saved. I've been saved. I'm saved. Hallelujah. We can be saved from God's wrath. We can be saved from the consequences of sin. We can be saved from that, beloved. And how we do that is we accept Christ inside our hearts and we give our sin to him. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you, God. And even in my wickedness, you still chose to die on the cross so that I can be free. The price, you paid it. Why should I harbor something that you've already paid for? God, I give you my life. I give you my life right now. And I want to pray for you. There are people here tonight, maybe you're, you're not saved, you're backslidden, you need God's forgiveness, amen. I want you to lift your hand with me for prayer. I want to pray for you. Believe God. God bless you, sir. Will there be any others? Let God forgive you. Listen, it's not between you and me. It's between you and God. Backslider, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You know the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You need to turn. Turn from your sin. Turn to God. He's the only one that can set you free. One final appeal. If you're not saved, you're backslidden within your heart. You let God, you let God forgive you. You lift your hand with me. Right up and right back down. God bless you. Want to be any more? Let God forgive you tonight. Let him set you free. Let him change you. Hallelujah. God bless you. One more time. Will there be any others? God will set you free. He can do it. Salvation is a miracle. It's not, it's not willpower. It's not, you know, intestinal fortitude. And those things are great. But when it comes to salvation, beloved, we need a miracle. We need God. We need God to help us. We need God to do it. Hallelujah. Before we close the service, amen, those of you that raised your hand, I want you to slip out of your seat from wherever you are. Make your way to the altar. We're going to pray. We're going to believe God if I can have some brothers and sisters come and pray with our brothers and sisters tonight. You come and you lay hold of God. Only the ones that raised their hand, I want you to come. If you raised your hand, I want you to come. Hallelujah. Church, the one, the, the, the one truth that sticks out to me about the slithering nat nature that Satan possesses and the slithering campaign that he will impart to other people is the whole time God will allow it. God will allow these things to happen. He'll allow it, beloved, as he did with Hezekiah, he withdrew from him that he might test his heart. And so many times, beloved, we go through things, God allows it in order to help us, in order to breathe into our lives and, and teach us God's disciplines and trials and even punishments are goal-oriented and I just want to appeal to you tonight listen uh, you know rather than ask why me why why is it always me why do I gotta go no no for you're asking the wrong question trust me I know I've asked the wrong question I've, I've done and wallowed and wallowed and gone round and round and round in the wilderness and you know, mad at God, mad at circumstances, mad at people. And, mad, and, and when I finally came to my senses and said, okay, God, obviously my whining and my complaining and my bitterness isn't changing anything other than making it worse. What do you want me 
to do. Father, I need your spirit to speak to me. I need to be wise. I need to be wise about what I'm going through right now because many times, beloved, in, our, in the throes of life, in the difficulties of life, many times that is when we are the most vulnerable. We are emotional. We are upset. And all it takes is someone to come along and agree with our grievances or agree with our carnality or our emotional content at that moment and the devil can take us out. Don't let that happen. We need to know ourselves. We need to be honest. Every time this happens in my life, this is how I react. It's not different. You're not special. You're not the only one. You see this pattern because you are willing to be truthful and know yourself. That's the first part of the battle. The second part is you know your God. You know your God. Say, you know what? I know God. I've seen God through the word of God allow things like this happen. It may not be specifically what I've gone through or specifically what I've experienced, but there are a lot of similarities and there are people in the Bible that have gotten the victory. I need to investigate his word and find out what they did to get the victory and that's exactly what I'm going to do. It was low down what they did to Joseph, sold him into slavery, you know, uh, uh, lied on, sent to, to prison at no fault of his own, but he was able to process that. He was able to forgive his own brothers. It was wrong what Penina did to Hannah, mock her because she couldn't have children, uh, and even her, her own husband wasn't even on her side, but she processed that. It was wrong what King Saul did to David. Uh, King Saul dealing uh, with witchcraft and insecurities. Uh, he was on a power trip. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and David uh, had opportunities to exact revenge. But because he knew his God, he didn't seek revenge. There's so many instances in the Bible that many, many of us, we live through today with people. And we can get the victory because the devil is smooth. He's subtle. He'll use people that are smooth and subtle. And we need to recognize so that we can move on and do what God has called us to do. God's dealing with hearts tonight. Amen. I want to open these altars for everyone else. You come and pray. And as you come and pray tonight, that should be your anthem. Lord, what do you want me to do? Help me see through this. Because see, beloved, we serve a God that's bigger than our circumstances. We serve a God that's bigger than what we're going through. There are people in this world that are computer savvy. And they run diagnostics and they run... Uh, certain programs to find viruses and different things inside the computer and they can fix it and they can figure it out and they you know they implement certain programs to fix and repair and you know uh, there, there are people in the world that, that are savvy they can figure that stuff out you know what's interesting about these people is none of them are inside the computer they're not on the inside of the computer. They're on the outside. The, the person that built the computer is not inside the computer. He's on the outside. Listen, uh, uh, the God who created the heavens and the earth and the universe uh, is not inside. He's on the outside. And he has solutions that are designed. But will we surrender and let him run his course, so to speak? Let him run, if I could use the computer terminology, uh, that, that antivirus program, that spyware program uh, through your soul uh, to find viruses, to find things, uh, amen, to get to the bottom of the issue. Uh, can you allow God to do that? So that you can be healed, so that you can be repaired, so that you can be restored. You don't have to run to sin when things aren't happening and going your way. You can run to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let him heal you tonight. Come on, church, let's pray. Let's believe God. Oh, God in heaven, I pray your hand. I pray your Holy Spirit upon us. 
Help us, Jesus, to see the truth, God, to see the forest for the trees. Hallelujah, to spot the enemy trying to wreck our marriage, trying to wreck our family, trying to wreck our ministry, trying to wreck our church, trying to wreck our destiny. The devil is a liar. The blood of Jesus sets us free. He's a liar, Lord. The demon is a liar. He will seek to confuse us by twisting lies with the truth. For his strategy is psychological and powerful, and we will not listen. Bring deliverance tonight to set people free. Give us clarity in the name of Jesus. And all who slither, I pray, by the grace of God, be exposed for who they really are. And let the devil be judged. And let the vessel be redeemed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to set people free. Thank you, Jesus. Father, prepare our hearts to receive all that you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Those of you that are not at the altar, you can stand this evening. We're going to close in prayer tonight. Hallelujah. Those of you that are at the altar, you can stay as long as you like. Hallelujah. You don't have to get up because everyone else is. We're going to close in prayer this evening. Hallelujah. Before we close in prayer, amen, I want you to lift your voice. And I want you to pray with me right now. Let us pray together in concert. Say, Lord Jesus. I thank you for my life and your light. The blood of Jesus sets me free from every demonic personality, from every slithering spirit and every host of that spirit. The blood of Jesus vindicates and sets me free. I trust you tonight. Forgive me, Lord. As my eyes and my ears have entertained such a spirit, I walk in truth and victory. These are my portion, and I thank you for your mercy in Jesus' name. Let's give God praise right now. Let's give him praise right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your work and your word. I plead the blood, God. Father, I ask, God, for your divine protection, God, over this precious people and their children. Father, we trust you, Lord God. You built a hedge of protection around Job. I pray you do the same for us, God. Cover us, God. Not only our character, God, but even our physical health and our circumstances. You are good. You are good to us. And you are greater than anything we've ever faced. We thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. God bless you.